And now on Sydney Weekend, cheers with Ben Maloof. Thanks to firstvintage.com.au. And Ben's here in the studio with me, another brilliant instalment of our weekly wine segment. And honestly, I get more emails about this segment than anything else on the program. So you must be doing something right. Welcome, Benny. Hey, Dan. Great to be here, as it always is. What's the difference between bottled wine and cask wine? Hmm. Okay, that's a really interesting question. Let's just have a quick talk about cask wine historically. Now, cask wine was invented here in Australia. It's an Australian invention back in the 1960s. And the reason that it came to being is... It was a way to put cheaper red wines that were produced in bulk out into the marketplace. So that's historically why it was made. Now, to this day, there is a little bit of a stigma associated with cask wine. You, you wouldn't turn up at a dinner party with a cask of wine, or would you? Well, look, you're going, on, people a, do. Look, you're going on a first date. I don't think that you'd <laughs> probably... Uh, that's not the way to impress straight off the bat. So it does have that stigma associated with it. Yeah. The other thing with cask wine is that when you're talking about a bulk vessel like that, it's going to take you longer to drink five litres of wine than it is going to take you to drink a 750ml bottle of wine. Now, that's sitting in your fridge for a week. You wouldn't and couldn't and shouldn't expect the wine to be as crisp and as fresh and as ready to drink as if you were to consume it just as you opened a bottle. So, I guess, long story short... You've got to think about cask wine in the context of mass-produced as opposed to handcrafted. Right. Okay. If you went down to Ikea and bought a really nice table, would you expect it to be of the same quality as a handcrafted mahogany table? Probably not, but you may still very well like it, and if that's the case, good luck to you. Good on you. Jerry emailed during the weekend. She says she and her husband just bought a house at Sutherland. And there are two dozen, uh, two dozen bottles of wine left in the cellar. How could she have them valued? Valued? Look, the internet is a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's fabulous because you can go online, you can actually start to see the you know, value of products and where you can uh, sell these things in a mm. secondary market. So mm. first thing I would say to Jerry is jump online, put in the vintage, put in the, the product and the variety, and you'll start to get a sense of what your product is worth. Now, there are a number of auction houses out there, and uh, if Jerry wanted to email us back, I'd be more than happy to put her in touch with somebody who is appropriate in her area and in her field. But look, to get a sense of what uh, what she's got, jump online, have a bit of a poke around and see what they're worth. And so would it, would it be a, a dedicated site that gives you prices or just Google? Just, oh, look, just punch I, it into Google? I just jump it into Google. Okay, I mean, right. there's a million... The, look, there, there is a plethora of uh, these, what they call is a secondary wine market. Right. And people buy and sell and trade a little bit like a trade post for wine right okay. uh, there are forums there are blogs there are you know there's any number of things so it's always a good place to start well just on Jerry's email then you know two weeks ago we were talking about porphyry pearl and I asked if you could still drink it if you had a bottle in the cupboard you said perhaps I wouldn't be Dan <laughs> but how can you tell if a wine you maybe put aside when your son or daughter was born you know tw- I'll drink that at the 21st how can you tell if that wine's going to be okay to drink are there telltale signs that the wine is crook Absolutely, there are some telltale signs. Now, if you've put a wine down, say, 20 years ago, it's obviously going to have been under cork. It won't be in a screw cap. So there are some really, really clear points as to whether wines are starting to turn. First thing you've got to have a look for is to see whether that cork has bloated and whether it's sitting above the top of the bottle of the wine. That's usually an indication that some air has gotten in it's putting pressure on the bottom of the cork. Now, if the air's gotten in, it means that it's oxidised the wine. Good chance it's going to have gone off. Okay, right. So the po- the cork popping out of the top a little bit, right? Absolutely. Okay. If it's seeping wine out the top of the cork as well, same principle. Generally, a chance that there's wine getting out. So would that maybe sometimes you see that just as a, a little run of wine, a, a single drop almost has run down the side of the top of it? Absolutely. It looks like a little teardrop running yeah, down yeah, the yeah, side yeah. there. No good? Uh, look, you can't say that it's not going to be good, but it's a telltale sign, again, that if wine's getting out, means oxygen's getting in. Yeah, okay. And as we know, oxygen takes wine back to vinegar. And the final thing is, if the neck of the wine, so that last little bit of the, the, the top of the wine there, if there is a big gap, there and there's lots of air in there is usually a pretty good sign that it's off. But you know what the real litmus test is, Dan? You open it up, you have a glass, and you see what it tastes like. (laughs) 
Well, you'd be able to smell it, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Look, you pop the, you pop the cork out it. of that, you'd, you'd smell, smell it. And, and it would smell like vinegar. You yeah, know, yeah. like all wine is go- tending back to vinegar at some yeah. stage. So you'll tell pretty quickly once you open the bottle. Okay. Elaine has emailed again. She wants to know if one particular wine has less calories than another. Look, I think we need to take Elaine out to dinner because she <laughs> seems to be our favourite uh, our favorite emailer at the moment. But look, yes, and unfortunately, the lower the alcohol, the lower the calories. So ca- alcohol actually has a huge volume of calories in it. So Really? So, okay, okay, because I was going to ask you, that was my next question, is low alcohol wine any good? Look, it is. I mean, look, the, the, the thing about, uh, you know, low alcohol wine is that it's fine if that's what you want to be drinking. Now, we've talked a few weeks ago about food and wine matching and yeah, yeah, yeah. putting a nice big steak with mm. a really big, heavy cab oh, yeah. oh, delightful. A little bit of butter <laughs> over the top. It's just, I always get myself in a bit of a, a frenzy when it comes to food. But... Those big, heavy wines yeah. are generally going to have big, heavy alcohol content. And unfortunately, it also means big. it's big and heavy in yeah, calories yeah, as sure. well. So there's nothing wrong with drinking or having low-calorie wine or low-alcohol wine, but just be aware that it's probably not going to be you know, bursting with those big, heavy flavors. So you're probably not going to want to pair it, for example, with a big, heavy food. Sunday afternoon with some oysters out in the sun, what a perfect accompaniment. There's one other really interesting thing that people sort of get a little bit confused about in my experience as well is that some of those sweeter style of wines, so your Moscatos... Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, and the Moscatos are really big in the marketplace at the moment. They're sweet, but they're low alcohol. So it's counterintuitive because you would think sweet, higher in calories. Naturally. Not necessarily the case. Okay. Because they're usually sitting around that 8 to 10% alcohol, they're generally a lot lower in calories. So I'm not going to say it's healthy for you, Dan, but it's definitely lower in calories. There you go, Elaine. You can hook into the low alcohol wine and you'll be uh, you'll be consuming less calories than any other. Benny, another outstanding report. Thanks, mate. We'll see you again next week after five for oh. another episode of Cheers. Always a pleasure, Dan, uh, and I look forward to speaking to the listeners next week. You can find Ben at firstvintage.com.au, that website address again, firstvintage.com.au.